with the first pick in the 2019 NBA Draft, the New Orleans Pelicans select Zion Williamson from Duke Iguodala. Oh, oh, blocked by James. They do have a timeout. Decide not to use it. Curry way down to bang, bang. Mamba out. How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to the uh, the Shot Clock Podcast. Today I'm joined by Aaron Cohen. Uh, he works for ESPN currently. Has his own page, Lakers all day, every day. Aaron, man, how's it going, man? I'm good. Hanging in there. Uh, just tough loss last night for the Lakers, but we're here. I'm happy to be here and, and get on your podcast. Yeah, that loss last night, uh, I watched the game. I was playing... 2K while watching it, and I remember kind of seeing that LeBron was going to be out. I saw AD was probable, Alex Caruso probable, and already we've already lost Rondo due to injury for the next two months. But that loss was about like 16 points against a small ball team, and you came out with your post yesterday saying what not to worry about. So for the listeners, why do you think we shouldn't worry about that kind of loss? So, I mean, obviously we all know the Lakers and the entire NBA haven't played a single game, a single real game in the NBA for four months. And um, one of the teams that are having a uh, tougher time just getting back in the swing of things are the Lakers. You clearly see it. The first game against the Clippers, they got lucky. Like, that wasn't even a good win. I mean, me, anytime the Lakers beat the Clippers, I'm going to be super hyped. But at the end of the day, from like a basketball standpoint, that wasn't a great win. And then got blown out by the Raptors. Um Played a very bad game against the Jazz up until the fourth. And then last night it was a terrible game. And, like, I know LeBron wasn't playing. Um, but the thing that's most concerning is the um, offensive struggles for this team. Um, but the reason why I'm telling everyone not to worry is because the Lakers have gotten to this point for a reason because they're one of the best teams in the league, uh, technically the second best team in the league. So I trust the coaching staff. I, t- I trust the players to get ready in, in time for the playoffs. Like, I mean – you don't get to where you are now just by luck. Like they're clearly a skilled team and they have what it takes to win a championship, winning 50 plus games already. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm not really worried. I'm very confident in this team. And I know Laker fans like to get, like to overreact and like to get super emotional over losses um, even more so when we win. So, I mean, I've, I'm used to this though. Like I've, I've been having to calm down Laker fans for seven years now and um, yeah, we'll be fine. I'm not worried. Yeah, the power of Lakers Twitter is unbeatable. I, I'll go through every night after a game, after a loss, or after a win, scroll through the comments. It'll be like a win against the Clippers. And you got Clippers fans commenting all mad. You got <laughs> Lakers fans come back at them, calling them clowns or anything. It's like the big, best comment you could watch is on there, better than watching your normal comedian. But then you'll go through, and it's like when we have a huge loss, it's everybody freaks out. It's like the SpongeBob meme where they're running through the room with the fire on it. <laughs> yeah, like like – any t- it's crazy how powerful Laker fans are because you see literally like let's say there's five minutes into a game Danny Green misses three shots he's trending on Twitter so it's just like it's unbelievable how how strong and how like quickly Laker fans are to react to things like in a second Laker fans will be like like one thing happens and it's trending on Twitter easily yeah it's LeBron's uh losing LeBron or well his kind of abilities have seemed like lackluster recently where he's kind of been scoring like 19 a game. I saw where like his averages are like 19 to 20.1, uh, about four games in already. And his stroke has been kind of like wearing for a lot of fans. And me, myself, I've been a little bit worried because um, I knew that was going to kind of happen once we had that break. And even he came on a podcast that was on the road or something with Richard Jefferson saying that his struggles were going to be a little bit bad. But his struggles, like what do you think about how he's been struggling in the bubble so far? Um, well, throughout the entire season, we've seen, um, or at least I've noticed that in many games, LeBron, all of a sudden, like, he'll just choose not to go a hundred percent. Like you see in games when he just puts his head down, um, and just drives to the basket or is like looking to be aggressive and looking to score. He can easily score 35, 30, 40 plus, um, anytime he wants to. But then sometimes you see, um, he's super passive. Like, for example, the first game of the season for the Clippers, extremely, extremely passive. And, like, honestly, I don't know why he does that kind of stuff. But um, the same thing, like, as a Laker fan, and since LeBron's been a Laker, he's never made it to the playoffs yet. Um, and I, my whole thing has always been 
none of this passive stuff's going to be happening once we get to the playoffs. I've been banking on that, and I believe that because we all know LeBron's a different animal in the playoffs. So that's my whole thing. Like LeBron, it doesn't even look like he's trying his hardest. That's my. That's why I'm not worried at all because I mean it's annoying how he's not trying, like how he's not going 100. And like Vogel sat him out last night because he wants to like basically load manage and make sure he's good for the playoffs. But um, I'm not worried at all because I know like as soon as the playoffs start, he's gonna flip a switch and just go crazy like he always has, like always has, and he's always shown us that he can do that. So again, like I'm very, very, very confident. I've never been more confident in the team since obviously like championship years, 2009, 2010. But um, yeah, my confidence level for this team is super high. Yeah, I remember kind of watching at the end of last season, his first season with the Lakers. It was kind of you saw where he's like, I'm going to activate playoff mode. Then towards 10 games after playoff mode was activated, he kind of started slowing down, kind of took things easy. You saw where he managed, load managed like the last four or five games of those. Yeah last like 15 games of the season and just kind of like chilled out and I remember just seeing him like not try as much it was about 23 point games about six assists like eight rebound games just kind of it was like a minimal version of like we're expected to see like a LeBron stat line of 28 eight and eight it's just like whenever you see him average like 23 six and seven it's just kind of like where'd LeBron go and it kind of like worries everybody but he takes that seat back and we've seen that so many seasons because uh, like the 2018 Cavs season, they come in, he's averaging like 30-something a game for the next um, right. 17, 18 games of the playoffs. He just went insane. And that's kind of like something that you kind of like got to be hopeful for heading into the playoffs, kind of like his expect his, your expectations for LeBron are a lot higher in the playoffs than they are in the regular season. Right. And a lot of the media criticizes him during the regular season. Like we saw the MVP debate. Right. He's barely even trying this season, still putting up insane numbers. That's what I'm saying. Like once we get to the playoffs, it's he's a different player. He's gonna every I feel this is what I think. He's every single play, he's giving it hundred percent. He's been he's been it seems like not I'm not gonna say he's been chilling, but like he hasn't been going hundred percent. I can confidently saying that I, I can confidently say that he has not been giving hundred percent every time. Especially I forgot to mention, obviously we have the Lakers that clinched the first seed. So like the at every game since then, it seemed like um it's felt I had like a preseason feel where like the Lakers really don't care, especially because Vogel is testing different lineups out like he would do in the preseason, just because in the preseason he would be getting ready for the season and seeing what lineups work for off the bench, um, just different lineups throughout the game. So that's exactly what he's doing now. We're about to be in the playoffs starting August 17th, and like he's just seeing what works and what doesn't. So it has a preseason feel. It doesn't really feel as serious as it would. Um, and that's that's also why LeBron didn't play because these games are – mathematically meaningless so it doesn't really matter for us yeah the preseason point you make is spot on like i can't you can't i could like thought of that before but you can't say any any better than what you just described he's trying to figure out his rotations vogel is he's already has a we've already won 50 games lost 17 so i mean you we clinched the first seed two days ago now there's not much else to worry about besides just kind of figuring out your rotations everybody getting back into the rhythm before the playoffs obviously the shooting woes is a lot right. of problem a lot of fans have. Even I'm kind of like, Ugh, Danny Green's struggling. He was 0 for 7. I'm that worried Raptors too, game. bro. Don't get me wrong. I'm worried too. Yeah, but it's just, it's nice to see. I'm glad as long as we're back in basketball, but once playoff time comes, I'm expecting championship or nothing, you know, because right. this is could be AD's, what, that could be AD, like let's say we lose in the Western Conference Finals. That could be AD's last game as a Laker and end up going somewhere else. I'm confident he's going to resign, but – What's your thoughts on ADs coming back or going in the free agency? Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with um, how deep we go into this playoff run. But at the same time, I think the Lakers and the city of LA and the Lakers organization have done a great job making him feel like at home and making sure it's his team. And, and, and like, especially I should point out LeBron because he's done an amazing job of kind of saying like, look, this is your team. I'm going to defer to you. And that's kind of right before the first game versus the Clippers in the beginning of the season. He was kind of talking about how this is AD's team. We're going to play through him. I don't know if you remember when he said that, but yeah, he was like, we're going to play through AD. Yeah. And then the first game, he was deferring to AD. And ever since then, he's been deferring to AD. That's why AD leads the, league in score, leads the Lakers in scoring. Um, and it's kind of been like his show on offense. And he's just trying to make sure that, um, I mean, make, make Anthony Davis feel at home. And like we see all these behind the scenes videos of like JaVale's vlogs and just you can tell Anthony Davis is very happy as a Laker. So that's one side to it. And then the other side is the basketball side. Like, obviously, the Lakers need to be playing well. 
And I think that LeBron is probably has probably had a couple of conversations with AD and also like the Lakers um, organization. They've talked to him about how LeBron, once LeBron is like um, like a year from now when it's kind of going to be AD's team, this team is going to be his team in the future. So I feel like signing a match with the Lakers for AD should be super appealing because the Lakers will literally be his and his team only to lead once LeBron is like no longer in the league, which is not that far along down the road. So, I mean, kind I mean, of it's the same up. thing with how he gave his number to uh, AD at the beginning of the season. Obviously he got right. turned down because LeBron's still wearing 23 until right. the 2020, 21 season. But I mean, LeBron made a whole Instagram post like this number is his now, but right. given uh, AD the twenty three, which is kind of like passing on the passing on the torch type thing. I think is between LeBron right. and AD right now. LeBron's kind of mentoring him, teaching him how. Like it's the same thing with LeBron going to the Heat. He goes to the Heat to kind of learn the championship mentality, win the championship. Comes back to the Cavs. They're in the they're in the finals every game or every season. And then he gets mm-hmm. the Lakers, misses that season because of injuries. But it's right. like, I think this is a lot of kind of history repeating itself. AD goes to a team that could that was contending at the beginning of the season last year, but obviously didn't make it due to injury concerns. But AD goes to this team with LeBron. LeBron gives him championship kind of aspiration, kind of teaches him the ways of winning a championship, and now AD is going to carry that on for Lakers generations to go if he stays long-term, which I think he's the player to stay long-term, possibly until he retires, in my opinion. I know. I mean, and just put yourself in Anthony Davis's shoes. I, I don't know. I think he's 26 or 28. I'm not sure which one I think it is. He's 26. But 26. He's a young guy, and, like, taking – like, he, he, I'm sure he doesn't take it lightly that he's going to – he has the potential to be the face of the Lakers franchise. Like, that's, that's like, a big deal. And and um, just the last thing I would say about that is that if the Lakers win a championship, it's a complete lock. There's no way he's going to leave. Like, there's no way he's going to leave after winning a championship with the Lakers. And, and he'll probably – he probably has a great chance of winning finals MVP, especially if Braun continues deferring to him. Being aggressive at the same time, deferring to AD. He'll win the MVP, finals MVP. I mean, there's so many great things about this team already. Like, like AD, we have such huge promise in him. LeBron, huge expectations going into the playoffs. He's a great leader for a team like what we have full of veterans. Uh, last year, great veteran for a team of young guys, kind of teaching them how to get in the game. They didn't get enough reps in together to kind of learn how to play well. But it's like we have such a great, well-built team, and going into the future, there's so much hope for it. And I think one of the things that we've got to worry about is whenever LeBron retires is how's the rebuild going to go? Or if we lose Anthony Davis in free agency, how's rebuild going to go? And I think that's the thing is rebuild mode is kind of like, so I, it's maybe a thing that the front office is thinking of is like, what will happen if we lose this? But it's a lot to worry about is like, if we rebuild, we got rid of our picks. So it's, we're back in the rut for three more years, five more years. Yeah, we just went through all that, um, like starting like around 2013 when when Kobe retired, or went in 2016. But at the same time, when 2013, we didn't make the playoffs anymore. So um, those years, all up until Kobe retiring, were kind of like just respecting him. Um, the Lakers really didn't have any chance because of the people that were around him. Like the Lakers could have made the play- made the playoffs easily if they had it, if they added pieces, just like LeBron. Like I don't think LeBron. Um, with with the team that Kobe had would have made the playoffs um, at that point in, in his career. So I just think that um, right now the Lakers got to focus on winning this, not only for this year, but also for the sake of the future. We want to be an attractive um, landing spot for free agents or potential trades. Like I know um, I'm not sure exactly when D book is a free agent, but he's one guy that I've been really thinking about that would, I feel would be amazing going with this team. Um, especially because we don't really have our point guard position on lock. We have Rondo, who's kind of getting old as well. We have Caruso, who's really good, but I, I just don't think he's at a point where he, he can start yet. And um, obviously we're talking about an all-star and Devin Booker here. So, I mean, none of the Lakers point guards compare to, to Devin Booker. So I feel like that would be a great fit to go with AD. Yeah, even like another good guy would be Zach Levine. I've I've ran through this trade in my head many times with Zach Levine if – because we know he already he's having problems with the Bulls. He's There was, like, reports last week where it was, like, something with the Bulls. He was kind of 
tired of the losing culture they have going on. And if I remember him in an interview All Star Weekend with uh, Paul Pierce and uh, uh, Kendrick Perkins, he was like, "If I'm going to a team, I want to be on a team with a great passer and a good big that can rebound and finish the right. ball." And people right, were kind of exactly. like, "Simmons and Embiid or LeBron and AD is those guys." And I think either one of these teams would be a great place for him to land. I would love to see him in the Laker culture, but what kind of trade are we going to make is the real question. So. It's, it's yeah, a lot I mean, to think about. Yeah, I mean, and honestly, um, I haven't really thought about any trade scenarios because I've been so locked in on what we have going on here. Like, it's been 10 years since the Lakers have actually been a very good contending team. So, like, I've just been so caught up in, like, how good we are this year and how successful it's been. Um, and I haven't really thought about trades or even – I haven't even thought about re-signing Anthony Davis because that's in – in the back of my head, that's always been, like, an automatic lock. Well, well, yeah. when, well in reality, it's – not an automatic lock that's what i think which we just never know fans never know what's going on on the inside so um like i said i think lakers got to focus on this year that's exactly what ad saying he's like i haven't even thought about free agency yet because we're so locked in on our goal of winning a championship this year because he has never won a championship um a lot of the teams a lot of the players in lakers haven't won a championship uh while at the same time we do have some veterans who have won but uh yeah the whole the whole focus is right now on these next couple months in the playoffs yeah we I want to talk a little bit more about your Lakers all day, every day page. Working for ESPN, you worked pastly for a couple other te- uh, a couple other marketing teams, but you're 21 now, and you started about seven years ago. Is what you told me before the interview, and for you to have a page built up to 204k followers already, kind of what's that process like for? Because there's plenty of kids that are trying to start their own page and get to where you are right now. Right. Yeah. So. Like you said, I made my page seven years ago. It was 2013, and that was when Instagram wasn't really a big thing. There was no mega influencers, um, and the tr- the strategies to growing a page have like really changed from then to now. Because back then, I can tell you straight up, what I was doing in the beginning was follow for follow for hours per day. And right now, you can't do that anymore because Instagram like limits you, and like they, they'll catch on, and they they won't they'll block you from following and unfollowing, and like it'll be it's very difficult. Um, so, I mean, back then, that's what I, I would do. I would do follow or follow uh, up until I got to like 10,000. Like it was a lot of hours per day just doing it um, and just posting. And I was young at the time. I had zero experience. Um, people just followed me because um, I was kind of the only option at the time. There was no real competition. There were a couple of accounts that were bigger than me. But I just started posting. And, and um, when I made it, I had no real expectations since I was young. Um, I w- it was in between the summer of eighth and ninth grade. I was going to high school. Um, no expectations, no no like goals. Just made the page out of pure passion for the Lakers, and and um, it kept growing and growing. And then I kept doing more and more research and becoming more invested in growing the page. And I kept meeting really cool people. I got noticed by some Laker players, some me- people in the LA media and analysts, stuff like that. So then, at a certain at one point, like I realized this could be something that. Um, I can turn into a career um, because I was never the kind of person to be super into my academics and straight A's. Like I'm the kind of student that works extremely hard to get just B's like barely B's like it, just school doesn't come easy to me. So, and I knew I was always passionate about sports and I was trying to find my way into sports, um, whether it was like an analyst, it was definitely not going to be an athlete because like, <laughs> I'm just not, not good enough to be in the NBA. Um, every, every kid thinks he's good enough until he realizes he's not. So, I mean, I started doing social media and, um, I got a job offer with Adidas for like a seasonal project just to promote their outdoor line that went really well. And then I got a job with a company called Q4 sports, which, um, is like an NBA startup shoe brand. They have like four or five endorsed NBA athletes ran their social, ran their marketing. So that was like a great experience because, um, since it was a small company had a big role, and I had a lot of freedom to do what I thought um, was beneficial for the company. And then from there, I was there for two years. I uh, went to you and then I entered USC. I transferred there as a junior and I got um, a job with the USC basketball team, um, running their social media, kind of focusing on live content, things that happen in the locker room, like just funny things that I can pick up in, in real time uh, at the games for the stories. Um, practices just a lot of live content that people would really like to see just like funny stuff that funny moments 
Um, that's been a great experience because that's exactly what I've been wanting to do for the Lakers, just running their social and doing like live content. So it was a great experience because I was doing that same exact thing for um, USC, which is amazing. So I did that my first semester and I'm still doing that now, but I just don't know if it's going to happen because of the virus. And then um, my other thing was I was a student ambassador for, I got an internship with um, Bleach Report and my job was to promote and just get everyone involved with the Bleach Report app, um, all the students on campus. So I would host pop-up events and parties and Bleach Report sponsored events where I would hand out like shirts, cups, um, all like Bleach Report swag and go into classrooms, present um, the new features and the app and just make sure everyone was aware of everything that was going on because they were rolling out a lot of stuff last year. And that went really well. Like I won like an award for the most um, like the, they have a, this program is for um, students all around the U.S. Um, at several different college campuses. And at the end, um, they had a leaderboard with like the people, the students with the most um, link generated app downloads. And I was number one. So like that was like a super cool award that I got. And then that led me all to ESPN, which I know you were leading to. Um, this has been like the greatest experience be, for me. Um, initially, it was supposed to be 10 weeks long and in Bristol, Connecticut at the ESPN headquarters. But unfortunately, at the, it was um, shortened to six weeks and moved to fully remote. So right now I'm in LA and I've been working. I'm, all, I'm on my last week of my ESPN internship. And my day-to-day -day is kind of just posting on all the ESPN owned platforms, uh, all the handles. So it's like at ESPN, at NBA and ESPN, at ESPN NFL, sports nation like everything that's espn owned um i joined the team it's about like 10 15 people controlling those accounts throughout um across facebook instagram twitter and snapchat so it's just it's been an amazing experience because they don't treat you like an intern there they treat you as someone who has already proven themselves in the social media world and they already trust you and your ideas and they would run with anything that they that you think would do well on social media so right away first day like i threw out three posts and just my ideas were valued as anyone else's who's been there for who could have been there for four or five years that's why like i really like espn just the camaraderie there and it's amazing so i mean if you have any other questions about espn or you can just ask me and like i can lead to that i want to talk all day here yeah that's that's wild to me is like you you're logged into the espn accounts like how you said nba on espn yeah. so Kind of one thing I've always noticed is whenever you get on the Explorer page, the notifications go wild. It's like 200 likes, 300 likes, 400 likes, all within like hours. So ESPN's already a multi-million follower account. So kind of do you? <laughs> this is such a weird question, but do you have notifications on on the page or are they off where you're not getting your phone blown up every 20 minutes? Well, I mean, yeah. Well, I, to back up my Laker page, I turned off notifications in like 2014 within a year because every time you can't get a notification every time you get a like because con like every second um even with my laker page i'm getting likes so i can't imagine with espn what it would be like so notifications have always been off and of course like not for a second have they been on for espn because that like my phone would break so because they have uh, i think 16 million on just espn alone so it's like a lot nah yeah and with not even ESPN made you a lot of connections that you have now. I'm sure it's made you connections, but your Lakers page, like you mentioned, you've been able to meet with NBA players. Like uh, this past winter, you met with Quinn Cook, Alex Caruso, uh, a couple years ago, Lethal Shooter. It's kind of like wild to me that you've made these such huge connections and you've worked so hard for that. So once you, what was kind of the point you realized once you made that page? Like I've kind of made it. Right. Well, it kind of depends on what you what you would like to define making it as. Um, there's like levels to it for me. So um, the first like tier, I would call it, of just thinking that I've made it um, was when I got that Adidas job where I was hired to promote their outdoor line, like hiking apparel for this winter um, project that they were running. So I was like, okay, like I got an offer. And then once it was over, within two months, we sold out the line. So that was kind of my first moment of realization that like, okay, social media could be a career path for me. Um, but that was, I guess, one. And then um, another example is Lamar Odom. I think it was two years ago now, 
he followed my page and liked a bunch of my pictures. And so I, we started talking in the DM and um, going back and forth. And we scheduled a Instagram live interview um, that did really, really well. And then after the interview, I hit him up and I said, look, look I'd love to do business with you. Um, if you can put me in touch with your manager, or your agent, whoever it is, because I think that we can do some really big stuff because Laker Nation still has a lot of passion for you. So, and love. So he put me in touch with his manager and it was a coincidence because that was around the same exact time where he was headlining the big three drafting combine. Like the whole big three was, it was surrounded around his name. And I went to Vegas and I covered him for three days or two days, two or three days. And it went really well and just covered him, um, was in the room with all everyone involved in the big three. I went to the draft. It was like a really, really sick experience. Um, something that I've never gotten to do up until that point. And after the three days, his manager hit me up and, and offered me a full-time role to be his right-hand man, um, just to coordinate everything for him, like his public um, appearance, uh, public appearances and his book signings and his magazine covers, Dancing with the Stars, like all that, just be there to coordinate everything for him. But I didn't take that because it would require me to drop out of school. And... Um, so we talked and we agreed on a social media role where I would represent him on social media, which um, lasted for about a year until I got to USC and like I had to move on just because of my other opportunities with USC. But I mean, that was a really cool experience that came purely from my Lakers page, Adidas purely from my Lakers page. Um, that's what I call my Laker page. It's always been the foundation of um, my career and opportunities that I've um, been given. It's all started with this Laker page because that's kind of been um what i had to show forth in any interview in any conversation like what have you done um it's my laker page so that's why whenever people ask me for advice um who are young and and like want to know what should i do how do i get my foot in the sports media world is to create your own platform and not to worry about the followers not to worry about who's following your page it's about bettering your content and just making sure that you're putting out good content because um, when the time comes, when you apply and when you put this stuff on your resume, they don't care about the, they don't care about the followers. Like I can tell you right now, let's say someone has a million followers and their content is absolute garbage. Like all they do is repost pictures and steal the word for word caption. Like people in the people in those positions will understand like these people are not dumb who are hiring, like they know what you're doing. So if they see, let's say you have like a 200 followers, 300 followers, 5,000 followers, but you're putting out amazing, amazing content, like genuinely amazing content that, that they can see would work well for their company or whatever it is, they'll hire you. Um, that's why I say like, they're like, I'm struggling. Like I've been working at this account for three months and all I have is 500 followers. I say, don't worry about the followers. Just worry about the content you're putting out and making sure you're getting better and, and analyzing other accounts and observing what they're doing and just piecing them all together and putting it to your page. That's why I just say, like, don't worry, never worry about the followers. That's really something that I have to stress. Yeah, that's one thing I've noticed with my podcast page is like, I I remember starting five, four months ago now, and I was like, I'm going to create original content. And I started creating my own original content through Photoshop. And for a while, I struggled. And I'd look at other pages. It's like, they, they'll have like 10K followers, but they just repost other people's posts with already like 100 followers or something like that. Like this right. person will make an original post and it always like kind of like frustrated me. So then I started doing it and I realized it's like, it does blow up a lot, but it kind of ruins your morale more. Cause it's like, what's the point of what I'm doing? I'm just stealing content for my own game. Great point. That's a great point. And, and like, I've talked to a lot of people about this. They say like, why don't I just create a page and like do whatever I'm doing, like whatever the point of the account is, but at the same time, throw in like viral type content. Like there's some posts that you know will go viral. Like for me, I get, I get posts sent to me all the time and they're like, oh, this would do so well on your page. And I know for a fact it would, but when you make your page all about things that are only going to do well for likes, you're, you're not building, in my opinion, you're not building it the right way. If you have certain goals, like if you're trying to build your personal brand, you're trying to build a business. You're not going to, you're not going to succeed when posting other people's content. So I was stressed to make sure that you build your brand in an authentic way. Um, very personable. Don't, don't try to be anyone else. Don't try to, um, it's okay to take other people's content, but always try to make it about um, what your thoughts are on it and always try to follow the same theme um, that you have going for your page. It just builds like 
um, reliability. Like people know what they're getting out of your page. Like you, you notice some pages have an extremely uh, high rate of engagement. So, I mean, yeah, that, that's what I would say about that. Well, man, that's all the time we have, but I, I really do appreciate you for coming on and your page is great. And I wish you best of luck uh, moving on in the future and great more connections. But thanks for checking out the Shot Clock Podcast, guys, and we'll see you next week. Peace.